Welcome to the first edition of Six Quilts, Six Know-It-Alls. I'm Julie Silver and I'm going to introduce this thing to you. I want to tell you the story of how this happened. Six friends, those of us you see on the screen, have been meeting on Zoom every week for a few months. We talk about many, many things. We talk about politics, we talk about our personal lives, we exchange recommendations for masks and wine. And did I say we talk about politics? <laughs> Believe it or not, we talk about quilts. And um, each week, one of us or more post a quilt about which is either interesting, newly discovered, or about which there's some mystery. And we all talk about it. And we come at it from very different angles. And uh, it's just been wonderful. It's been fun. Uh, we've all learned a lot. And um, it's, it's really enlightening to do this kind of confab. Um, so we, a couple of weeks ago, thought, why don't we do this and let everybody come in and see us do it? Um, so that's what we're going to do. Welcome to the maiden voyage. And um, I promise that we will leave out the personal stuff and the politics. Um, we're experimenting with technology. So you bear with us here. You'll see a, a recording of each of us um, presenting one quilt each, and then a conversation between the six of us um, about that quilt. After the recorded session, we'll be live and we'll open it up for, for questions, comments, corrections, and praise. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> let's get started. And um, the six of us are um, Robert Brackman from left to right, me, Julie Silver, Lynn Gassett, Alden O'Brien, uh, Debbie Cooney, and Mary Kay Waldvogel. And on the screen, you're seeing our names in alphabetical order, starting with our first names and uh, ways to get in touch with us if you wish to do that, because we're all lecturers and each of us can do a Zoom lecture and, or, or two. Um, this will come up at the end as well, so don't worry about it. Let's start with Barbara. And um, let me tell you a bit about her. I just met her yesterday. <laughs> and um, here's what I want to introduce her with. Barbara's a quilt historian and author. She lives in Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas. She's written many books over the past 40 years. She started writing when she was six. And um, she indexes patterns, exploring women's history through their quilt making and giving guidelines for dating fabrics and quilts. She writes several blogs about quilt history, including material culture and Civil War quilts. And um, Barbara's going to show us a quilt, and then we're going to talk about it. OK, let's see how this works out. So the quilt is behind me, and it's, it's something I paid a little more than I probably should have. I got it maybe 10 years ago. A couple who were older than me were looking for a place for it to go. They had bought it in 1971 in either Wacobic or Wacoba, New York, which is in West Chester County, just north of the city. And they had a great story about it. Uh, this church, the Presbyterian Church of South Salem, has been around for 100, 150 years. And every year they have a sale. And every year, until fairly recently, the grand dom of the area would bring one thing out of her attic to put in the sale and there would be just spirited bidding because this attic hadn't been touched in a long time. So that's a story I heard. And Miss Constance Hunt was the grand dame. And she said that this particular quilt had been in the attic since 1864. And she said that the woman who made it, which was one of her great aunts, although she did not give a name, was engaged to Mary and was making this quilt during the Civil War while her sweetheart was away. Now, I have heard that story a million times, and I very rarely find it to be true, but it's such a good one. But anyway, the guy came back, which is good, because most of the time the story is he was killed. But he did come back, but by then she didn't want to marry him. And so she folded it up in newspaper and put it in the attic for 150 years. and. Uh, Miss Constance brought it out, unwrapped it from the newspaper, and these people bought it. Um, so I said, this is a really good story. I got to have this quilt. So, but as I get older and wiser, I'm starting to doubt whether or not it's Civil War years. It's, mo it's mixed fabrics, uh, mostly wool combinations, and you can see some 
some moth eating here. Uh, and it's interesting that the moths are eating the wool and not the cross fabric, which might be silk or might be cotton. So it is, is definitely made of the kind of fabrics that were popularly worn during the Civil War, especially what we call, I called the lane. It's a combination wool and cotton. And because it's combination, you can print on it quite nicely and sharply. And because it's got a lot of wool there, you get a really nice, brilliant color that you don't often be able. You can't get that, that brilliant color in cotton as easily as you can in wool because wool takes the dye better. So it's, it's full of these dress fabrics from the Civil War era. Uh, foulards, these little spotty prints. I love this picture of this woman who is styling. And plaids, a lot of wool plaids in there and combination fabrics, as I say. I think there's probably some wool and silk. There might be some silk, but for the majority of them, they're cotton and wool. The back is one big piece of combination fabric, a great stripe. So she had quite a bit of that. And then the binding is the same thing. And here again, I have the, the one fabric that's failing, which is repeated often, it's this brown wool because the uh, moss or carpet beetles have chewed and selected what they wanted to eat. Now, as I say, I'm a little dubious. Um, when I look around for dated quilts with the same fabrics, I have this one, a log cabin that's in my files made by Susan Messenger and she dated it at 1876, which is 12 years later. So my question for the group is, do you think it's 1864? Have I been sold a bill of goods? <laughs> well, if I can start. Yes, a lot, a lot of the fabrics um, look like they're, uh, they're distinctly um, dressing gown fabrics mm -hmm. from that period. I didn't, I didn't see anything that stood out to me as, as being later than, than what you think. Um, my question is, if I can change the topic a little bit, is why did the moths choose just the brown because there's wool throughout the whole thing because there's a the alternate yarn is cotton yeah i know but there's lots of wool throughout the whole quilt why did why, why did they, they just, just eat the brown i have no idea what and that's the only thing that's eaten that's moth eaten that's a good point i've seen that um fairly frequently in uh amish quilts from lancaster county that are wool or wool blend there'll be one color and since they're such big pieces one of the colors will be eaten and the others will not. And they're, they appear to be the same fabric. Um, it it they, could it have to do with the dye? Yeah, like so the they dye don't like the dye? That's a good well, we know what browns do. Yeah, and when the people sold to me and said, now there's some damage and that, I bet 20 pieces like this are chewed on. And they, they were told it was matter damage that the brown dye had rotted from the iron mordant but i this looks more like insect damage where it's chewed you know rather than what's it, what's the term inherent vice my favorite expression we, is it sometimes called shally it is shally yeah, really, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think lynn what do you think is it one on? way and so well it in in the period shally shally was all wool and Delenn was cotton warp and wool weft. The silk warp and wool weft. Barege. Barege, thank you. Yes. Barege. Silk warp, wool weft, really light and floaty. That's barege. Yeah. All wool uh, printed like this. That's a chalet. Um, cotton warp, wool weft is a Delenn. And what yeah. was, say the first one again and spell it for us. Barege. B A. R E with a going down accent and accent, accent grob G E accent grob sorry accent grob B R E B A R E G E Barege. Barege. It's, Barege. I, I see it a lot in people's diaries and how they spell it is always a treat. Well, that, <laughs> that too, that too. And, it, and isn't it so that the those terms for fabric change over time? Yes, and so today, Shally. I go to the, you know, the clothing fabric store and Shelly tends to be a rayon and 
it's the drape that seems to define it. It's sort of the weight and the hand now that define it. Yeah. But you know, all of these fine-tuned terms for both cottons and these wools and wool blends, we forget the range of wools there were. It's a real loss that you know during the all through the 19th century, you just had and 18th, you had so many more choices. Uh, when it came to fabrics, and we've actually become quite impoverished in, in our dress fabric choices, but that's a whole different topic. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that the fabric terms were actually pretty fluid, even in that period. Um, and sometimes were used incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see these in dressing gowns, you see them in sort of at home and sort of ordinary day dresses. Um, I don't have a real problem seeing those as, as 1850s and early 60s. Um, even the browns. Mm. I mean, you'll never prove it. I just, um, I've had a chance to do a little digging on ancestry. I'm your resident gene genealogy person here. It's, it's, it's a disease that comes over you when you work at the DAR for, for decades. And I looked up Constance Hunt and she was born in 1894 and she's in the 1900 uh, census leaving in, living in Lewisboro in Westchester County. I haven't looked up on the map, but you know, Westchester County is, is small enough that it's all within um, striking distance of each other. And um, her, her parents were born in the 1850s. So when we're talking about a great aunt, we're talking about the next generation up. So I guess that that's plausible that, you know, her parents born in the 1850s, her parents' parents would be born in the 1830s-ish and one of them could be um, engaged, one of them could be a little on the younger side or, um, and, getting and being engaged in, in about 1860. So you're saying it could possibly be from 1864 and that story could be accurate. We want to remember that in dating a quilt, you want to go for the newest, the newest fabric. That's right, because it can't be earlier than that latest fabric. And it all seems very consistent though with the, to me as a person who's not a costume person like Lynn and Aldenar, it seems consistent with that mid 1840s, 1860s. Now, I just wonder, you know, the style with the piece, template piecing, that's very possible 1840s, 50s, 60s. I, I think it's gotta be at the 1860s end because of that purple, because purple really comes into fashion after the invention of mauve in 1856. Ah, which also purple. Yeah. Very nicely. Mm -hmm. And there's another purple. You're right. Yeah. So starting like, you know, in the 1860s, you start to see those jewel tone colors becoming very fashionable uh, for women's dresses. Yeah, really bold colors. Well, I love that one with the, um, oh, go back. I love this one, that one over there with the, um, the, that one exactly with yes, the combination of stripes. I feel as if I've seen um, the DAR um, has a dress from the 18, uh, just about 1864 with almost that same stripe. Um, I'll see if I can call it up. Um, if it's in our um, online database, I might be able to put it on the screen. Um, uh, but you know that com that those combination stripes where you get a series of different colors and you get something that looks like a woven geometric like those things on the green and then you get something that is pretending to be a plaid and then you get a floral and then you get a little and here's uh, another what geometric braidy looking thing it's just um, so 18 say 1850s 60s 50s 60s so here's another one with the combination stripe i do love those and you know it's so hard to believe when we look at the black and white pictures that the dresses were that colorful so that was, that was one of my recent rants on facebook is that people you know so often and and movies so often dress you know lower class people in brown and yes and black and, well, and yes on, they had color but yeah it's hard to imagine this photo of this woman and her child you know in color I, I told you i worked on the movie and one of the big arguments we got into is i tried to dress everybody up in the colors that were available at 1860s and the uh, guy one of the production guys said no people want movies to be sepia 
<laughs> okay, so everybody wore brown. Well, you know, yeah, that just drives me nuts too. And you know, when we had um, people come to look at our quilts to do a line of um, quilt re of reproduction fabrics, we didn't try to you know force them to do the document print colors. But when they sent us the, you know, the samples for what they were thinking of doing, th th it looked as if they just dumped it all in mud for a week, you know, and I said, you know, did you see the original quilt? Because that had, you know, almost jade green and teal blue in it. And, and this is just tea stained. And it's like, oh, well, they, they think it needs to look oldie tiny. And it's like, we just showed you 50 quilts from the early 1800s that were bursting with color. Have you learned nothing? Apparently nothing. Apparently not. It well, was I have learned a lot from you know-it-alls and I feel a little better about my quilt. Of course, I still love it. It's a great quilt. It, it is, is a great quilt. It's a wonderful quilt. I'm, I'm impressed by the beauty of the fabrics and how many gorgeous ones there are. Yeah. And I wonder if you had a sense that the people uh, the family that it came from was uh, more than middle class. Oh, or listen, Miss Constance was way more than middle class. Okay. Way so, more. Lynn, you weren't suggesting that this particular quilt would have been uh, of, of people of lesser status, social no, status. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just talking about how, you know, color in general was just vibrant for centuries and and um, producers. Could I show you this dress that. because I think it's it's fabric is remarkably similar to the one we were just looking at. Take a look at that. Oh, um, yeah. wow. I mean, so much going on. Exactly. It's gorgeous. You've got a stripe. You've got a whole big stripe of the flowers on the black background. Then you've got this geometric oh. brown thing. Mm -hmm. Then you've got this monochromatic oh. green floral. And I the think print. it's very reminiscent yes. of the one we were looking at. So I just wanted to show you that. Well, yeah. so we should have a, you know, a lecture for, for muse, uh, movie set designers and costume designers, but I don't really want any input. Thank you very much. Can I make one more? I know we're running out of time. One more really quick point. Um, the, the fabrics in Barbara's quilt, I would not say that those are necessarily upper class. I'd say that, you know, those are very middle, upper, wouldn't you call this? Yeah, comfortable I mean, middle. Very, totally, absolutely the common mm -hmm. sort of fabrics that you see in um, women's, you know, everyday sort of dresses. I'd agree. There were a, a, and lot, of prints, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different prints and solids. So either lots of clothing scraps or, borrowed from or given to her by someone else to make it look um, even more colorful. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had a good eye of putting things together and make things stand out. Oh, she really had a good eye for that. Those tumbly blocks are hard to, to keep that illusion going. She had enough fabric she could pick and choose those pans. Well, we could go on and on. We, and we do. Sometimes. And if it was Monday night, we would. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we would. But um, let's move on. And uh, reminding you, people who are watching that um, on Saturday when this comes up, you can um, comment or ask questions and we will be live at the end of the, this recorded um, video on Saturday. So we're gonna move to Lynn. Uh, Lynn Bassett is an independent scholar. She specializes in historic costume and textiles. Among her many projects are award-winning exhibitions and catalogs, including Homefront and Battlefield, Quilts and Context in the Civil War, co-authored with Madeline Shaw in 2012. Lynn was also primary author and editor of Massachusetts Quilts, Our Commonwealth, 2009. In 2019, she was guest curator of the exhibition, Pieces of American History, Connecticut Quilts, at the Connecticut Historical Society, which is now available for viewing online. And how would they do that, Lynn? Just go, uh, to the Connecticut. Go, go to the Connecticut Historical Society website and you'll see um, you can choose exhibitions and then there's online exhibition choices. So. It's wonderful. So do it, folks. 
Okay, well, my uh, quilt came up because I'm the guest curator of an exhibition next year at the Florence Griswold Museum. And this exhibition looks at um, certain groups of needlework from New London County in Connecticut uh, from the mid 18th century to the early 19th century. And among the, this group uh, are three applique uh, summer spreads. They're just a single layer. This is the first one um, made by Bridget Bradford of Montville. They all three are from Montville. All three are made by members of the Bradford family uh, from 1805, 1807, and 1808. This one ended up at the County, New Jersey Historical Society because there's a Montville, New Jersey, and that's where they thought it was from, but it's from Montville, Connecticut. Okay, and the thing that's really distinctive about these is not only the, the applique, but these cross-stitched uh, mottos and uh, signatures and, and um, along with the date. And this one has a religious verse uh, out of the Bible, Luke 13, six or nine, the barren fig tree spared at the request of the dresser. Okay, here's the second one uh, at the Henry Ford Museum. This one was made by Esther Bradford um, a couple years later in 1807. It has a more patriotic uh, symbolism, but it also has a religious verse. And this is the third one and the Connecticut Historical Society hasn't photographed it yet. So these are just my snapshots uh, made by Charlotte Raymond in 1808. And um, it's this very similar idea where you've got the, uh, the um, cross-stitched uh, name and, and mottos within these banner designs, uh, a single fabric used for the applique on a plain white background. Um, and here it's another uh, verse out of the Bible. And uh, this one has three, three grapevines in the design, which is out of the Connecticut state flag, uh, which is another story that we don't have time to get into. But so again, it's kind of mixing patriotism and, and religion. Okay, so these three women are are related. Bridget Bradford was the sister of Eleanor Bradford, who was the mother of Charlotte Raymond. So we've got um, Charlotte's mother and aunt um, who made these three pieces. And this is where they live. This is New London County in Connecticut. New London County is right on Long Island Sound. And, um, and the star is right where they lived in Montville. Um, and this is one of those mid 19th century maps that actually notes the names of families within the town. So you can actually see where people lived. I love these maps. And then this quilt came up on Facebook one day. I think Barbara posted it. Um, and I was like, Wow, is that another Montville quilt? Because it has such a similar aesthetic, so much white space, you know, a single uh, calico chosen for the applique, a very similar eagle in the center, and it's got the cross stitched verses, uh, this time inside these oval cartouche, cartouches instead of a banner. Uh, but this one is at the Tennessee, Tennessee State Museum. It has been on display, according to Mary Kay, for decades, or it was for a while on display for decades, um, and celebrated as Tennessee's earliest dated quilt. And so my, let's see, oh, here's, here are the, um, the cross stitched mottos in here. And she has all the states within um, the, the uh, intertwining of the ribbons around that oval. 
So here are all four together. So I hope you can see why I was like, hmm, is that another one? So my question was, because nobody has been able so far to find a Rebecca Foster in Nashville, Tennessee, was, was there a Nashville in Connecticut? And indeed there was, but there are also Nashvilles in 35 other communities that are still called Nashville. It's not from South Dakota. <laughs> you think? Um, so, so could it be Nashville? Where's Nashville, Connecticut? It's not a name that is in use any longer. Okay, Nash, there's Nashville, Connecticut. Nashville was a section of Preston, which is the town bordering Montville. And Nashville was right on the western edge of Preston, right against the neighborhood where the Bradfords lived in Montville. And of course I went, oh, oh my gosh, that's gotta be it. That's gotta be it. I did too. <laughs> I did too. But, but Nashville in Connecticut was not called that. There's no documentation of it being called Nashville until the mid 19th century. So approximately 40 years after the quilt was made. Hmm. Ooh -hoo. So that begs the question, is it really Nashville, Tennessee? Um, Nashville seems to have been sophisticated enough by 1808 uh, to have a, a fancy quilt. Uh, and who is Rebecca Foster? So genealogical research has shown that there are a whole bunch of Rebecca Fosters, but which one is the right one? That I have not been able to figure out yet. There were Fosters in Preston, Connecticut in the 18th century. I don't know if there were any there in the 19th century, but there were Fosters there in the 18th century. So not being able to find Rebecca and, and figure this out that way, I just, I wanted to look at the quilts and think about the similarities and differences in their construction and see if there are any clues there. Um, the thing that really, I think speaks to there being something tying these together is that really tight time frame because we've got 1805, 1807, and two from 1808. That's a really tight time frame. Yeah. And the aesthetics are so similar. And the idea of using the cross stitch and all that. Um, so here we have the eagle, very similar, not the same, but very similar. But the eagle was wildly popular in the early 19th century. She could have seen the eagle anywhere. Um, it was on, uh, it was on um, coinage. It was on signs. It was carved into furniture. It, it was everywhere. So where did the idea of the cross-stitched initials, the, the, the cross-stitched mottos and such come from? Has anybody seen this in another early 19th century quilt? That is the difference. Um, mm. It's so different from any Tennessee quilt. Um, I, I'm going to ask the obvious question. I think it's obvious. Couldn't a town or area be called it Nashville before it was officially named Nashville? Couldn't people who live there call it that? The thing about Nashville, Connecticut, and, and when this happens in New England, it, it's generally called Ville, you know, it's a village within a, a named community because it is centered on a mill mm. and the owner of the mill. Oh. And Mr. Nash established his mill in Preston in the 1840s. <laughs> so it probably isn't called Nashville and Preston before the 1840s. Boo. Mm. Um, 
I, okay. I've always thought the blue fabric, here we go. Yeah, the blue fabric. Is it a resist? Could it have, anyway, you go on. Like You're it. talking about it. Yeah. Or, it looks like a resist. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other thing that, you know, it's quite different in its technique. The applique technique is different. You can see that the ones from Connecticut are um, just turned under and, and blind stitched, mm -hmm. whereas the Tennessee one has the buttonhole stitch. Mm -hmm. The Tennessee one is actually finished as a quilt and has stuffing while the Connecticut ones are just a single layer. Uh, let's see the, back to all four. The Connecticut ones have the rounded corners. The uh -huh. Tennessee one is square, rectangular. Good point. Yeah. So I think I'm left with the conclusion that great minds were thinking alike. I don't know. What you can't just generate an idea like that. Okay. It has to be contagious. I, there has to be a connection between those four pieces. So perhaps the Nash family that was there in the 18th century had connections to the Bradford family and maintained them and ideas and letters flew back and forth. Do you really think this is Tennessee, Mary Kay? Uh, no. <laughs> ah, really? I mean, I've lived here a long time. I remember seeing that quilt when I first, you know, it was in Safford and Bishop. It mm -hmm. was in, uh, you know, and, and I did look and it said that uh, in what, 1970, it was owned by a private individual even though, so it was probably on permanent loan to the museum. So there, I think that is one area, avenue to pursue is to, after COVID, maybe go to the museum or I, I'd be happy to do it, or, or you do it over there. Well, I've just been, ask, ask. I've just been talking with the, with the curator who is super interested and nice and willing to help, but because of COVID, she can't get into the museum mm -hmm. and look at the files whatever oh, she has whatever she has in the computer doesn't, the doesn't discuss provenance I Bradford would, is a name that i mean i think it might be interesting to pursue to look in nashville maybe alden can do that um, I, if I, any I, if any I, of those I, names like I, bradford shows up in, i'd be happy to look that up um it says Foster right there, right? It says yes. Foster. It says yeah. Foster yes. in Nashville on, inscribed on the quilt, right? Yes. Right. All this discussion, I start to lose the initial threads. Yeah, I, I also wonder: is there any possibility? And this doesn't seem like a typical migration pattern for this period. You know, if you lived in Connecticut and you were moving west, you tended to go to upstate New York or you know Ohio, Western Reserve, as we know, but. Um, is there any way that somebody from New London, Connecticut ended up in Davidson County, Tennessee? And, um, and that's, that's where having the provenance of the quilt that we can't get to right now would help. But I could at least start showing, you know, if, if they were founded in, um, if Nashville was founded in 1779 and became the county seat in 1806, uh, often those old county histories that were published in the 1870s and 80s and 90s, um, by congressional decree, apparently, around the time of the bicentennial. They're very useful. And often, uh, you know, they'll usually go town by town um, and say, oh, and the earliest white settlers of this community were X and Y and Z. So sometimes you hit pay dirt and you find exactly the person you were looking for mentioned in these old histories. Right. Um, so that, I mean, it's a little bit of a needle in a haystack, but I'm happy to, you know, pick up that that thread and, and look for it. Another thing would be to go through the census, maybe the 1840 and see who. Of course, the who was born in Connecticut. Uh, yeah, and that's right. And the 18 um, the 1810 census won't say where anyone's born, but if we find Bradfords or Fosters in uh, Tennessee, in Nashville, Tennessee, in the 1810 or 1820 census, that gives us a little bit of a connection. But you're right. Um, 
Barbara, it doesn't prove that they're from Connecticut yet. Yeah. From my understanding, uh, maybe I'm misremembering. I, I think Mary Kay, you said this, but there weren't any fosters in Nashville that you found, right? I, I didn't do the, the genealogy. Oh, okay. Candace. Okay. Also, yeah, the, I would look at, um, I'd look in, I mean, just to look, since Nashville shows up in so many other states, look in north of it, Kentucky and Ohio. Look for fosters in either one of those states. There were, there's like two Nashvilles in New York. Yeah. Do you think it looks like a New York? You know, it's a blue and white. I. Anyway, I've had my. I. I'm. I think it's very cool that you're doing this, mm -hmm. and I think everybody is. Nobody's going to be upset if we find out it's a. Well, the oldest one. I, maybe. I. You know, I. I am so indebted to curators around the country who are so helpful and and uh, the curator of the Tennessee State Museum really could not be more willing to help as soon as she can go to the museum. Do the work. Okay. If you close your share screen, I'll show you the pictures that I took when Mary Kay and I were looking at it two years ago when it was on display. It is not on display all the time now. We want to make no. that clear because uh, there was an exhibit. Yeah. But it used to be on display. They were so proud of it. You're right that it is. It's it's funny that it's got the um, buttonhole stitching, Burdery Paris, whatever we wanted to call it, um, a, instead of being the traditional, the other kind of form of applique, yeah, the turned under. The little turned. And yet, and also it's not rounded at the edges. And yet, you know, the use of the cross stitch really is mm -hmm. remarkable. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not in the it's not in the banners the way the other was. So, so, so you guys who are watching us are now getting a taste of what we do. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, we toss it around, we pick up each other's balls. I'm gonna pick up the genealogy ball and get back to you. Exactly. We sometimes are left with a mystery and ongoing research, and we get back together and we report back to each other once we get more information. Well, let me just suggest one other thing. I mean, those slender uh, branches, those, those wispy branches are so unusual that the only other thing I can think of is a common source of some sort. You know, as a, as a, as a print of some kind, that the eagle is very common, but not those slender, slender branches. I mean, that is just so unusual. There's just got to be a connection somewhere to something else that they both saw because it just doesn't look like it was made in the same place as the yeah. Brad. Yeah, I think you have to remember, I'm always interested in women's work and how this is a commercial enterprise. What if someone was selling the pattern in Connecticut? Or draw, she would come over and draft it for you. Right. Yeah. Well, that'll be our next discussion. discussion. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go on. Go on. So we continue. Mary Kay, you're going to be on. And Mary Kay Waldvogel is a quilt historian and author. She lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. Her quilt research spans a broad swath of quilt history from 19th century Southern quilts and patterns through uh, 20th century quilts and quilt makers. Her books in Quilts of Tennessee, 19, 1986, Soft Covers for Hard Times, 1990, Patchwork Souvenirs of the 1933 World's Fair, 1993, and Southern Quilts, Surviving Relics of the Civil War, 1998. You know, when I started out my career, I was a collector and I didn't have a lot of money. And so I, I didn't spend a lot of money on quilts. I loved quilts that had a lot of fabrics. And I'm gonna share to, or with you this one, uh, I call it simply a hexagon silk quilt. And uh, I don't know much about it. I bought it in about 1980 at a, like a, just like a farm auction in um, here, close to me in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it was introduced as an Amish quilt. And I thought, no, this is not Amish, but I liked it anyway, because as they held it up, and I think you could see it here, there's a big um, kind of a hexagon in the center. I'm gonna start this 
slideshow. Let's see. And here we go. So you have it bigger. Okay. Uh, you could see there's a big um, kind of an edge of a hexagon uh, in the center. So anyway, um, I, since it's unknown, all I can say is um, describe it. It's a center medallion, hexagon pieced all over. Um, I, these would lead me to believe that it was pre-Civil War. 1840s, 50s. Uh, it is hexagon pieced, as I said, uh, all over, not in, in little groups or in blocks. Um, but interestingly, it is not English paper template pieced. So I think that it might be American. Uh, another interesting part of it is that it is tacked and not quilted. And the tacking, we'll see this later, um, at the knots, there's a little metal bead, I assume it's metal, uh, attached at each knot. The binding uh, is really well done along the edge. Um, you know, that's hard to do around all those little hexagon edges. Um, it, the dimensions are 70 by 88, about the size of to cover top of a bed and go down a little bit. The materials are dress weight silk, the backing is a beautiful cambric, um, and the batting is cotton. I think I told you that it was wool, but when I put it up, it's behind me right now. And when I put it up, I realize it is cotton. So you're going to see that. OK, the next one is. So my questions are, who made it, of course, when, where, and why? And I brought it to you all today because I think I'm wondering if there are any regional characteristics or maybe some costume or fashion clues that would add some um, information to this one. At the very center, let's go back real quick. At the very center, you see there's a white kind of rosette. And here's the close up of that, um, that very center. It, um, they're white and beige colors. Uh, again, as I said before, there's no evidence of paper piecing. Um, they are not terribly well made, well put together. The hexagons are, are kind of large. They're the size of a, um, a silver dollar, about one inch on a side. And again, I'm asking, I'm wondering about that white and off-white, if maybe this could be from a wedding outfit, a wedding dress. And I'd also like to know, we could come back to this, how you would describe this floral weave on this uh, silk. Notice also that as she, whoever was making this, as she moved out from that center rosette, she, it looks like she's at, trying to add on um, maybe light and dark hexagons. And then the next round has a lot of this brown striped silk. And I thought that might be uh, a good way to maybe date the silks. But she's got a problem right from the beginning. <laughs> The placement of the light and dark and the solids and the stripes is not consistent. She began, it begins to get a little wonky. There are a lot more striped silk fabrics here. And my question is, when are these popular? Um, Lynn did send me the picture of the dress on the right. We can talk about that. And I think it is very similar to the, the fabric in that dress, except that the colors are not the same. Um, here's some more silk in the, um, some close-ups of it. There are plaids. There's some, here, you see quite a bit of blue here, but for the most part, the colors in this quilt are muted, uh, kind of khaki colors and, and uh, medium to dark colors. Lynn did send me Lynn, um, this page from um, a catalog that she wrote, uh, quilts, in the collection of the historic Greenfield, uh, historic Deerfield. And the quilt in the upper left is very similar in a way to the one uh, that I brought to show everybody. Um, it was made from about 1850 to 1859 in Palmer, Massachusetts of what Lynn thought were um, silk uh, dress weight, dress weight silk fabrics. Interestingly, that one it is made 
we call potholder style. So each one of those little squares, the, the, the pattern she called it wild geese. So each one was made individually um, and then put together potholder style. And there's a thread, a, a continuous thread that goes from the bottom all the way to the top, I think, or at least it's anchored, like it's anchored right here. It goes between the silk and the cotton batting. There's a knot with, with a bead in it. Then it goes up underneath the silk and it's knotted right here. And then you, we could see it scooting right up here and knotting that. So the, the, there's no quilting, but the three layers are joined together this way. Uh, the tacking, um, I've never seen tacking like this done um, on a quilt. I think it, the, the use of uh, metal beads here is unusual. Notice also that the tacking goes at the intersection. So it, goes, it would be going down here too. So basically there's a, there, there should be uh, rows of this thread. What is that? About a half inch apart. And lo and behold, you could see that on the back of the quilt. You could see those um, pieces of thread going the whole way up. Um, so the grid is visible on the brown. I call it cambric. We might talk about what cambric is. It's cotton as far as I understand. It was used as a, um, a lining and of, of, or maybe inside bodices. And it, um, my understanding also was it was used in lining coffins. The tacking thread is brown cotton and it's amazing. If that had broken, I would have metal beads all over the place, but I don't. I think every metal bead is still in place. The separate binding, as I said, is black and it is uh, wearing down a little bit and it's um, hand, um, it's, se it's a separate binding, it's put on by hand on all four sides. So let's take a look, closer look at those beads. I assume it's metal. Um, we could have them talk about it later, uh, but um, and this again is at the intersection, really even a close, closer view than I showed you before. And, and Lynn again sent me some um, examples of purses that have what's called cut steel beads in them. And this one is a little purse she found on Etsy and they dated it 1850 to 1900. Which would dated it 1850 to 1900. They had it as a 20th century, but they're wrong. Okay. So anyway, so if it, it okay, the know it all. Yes. But uh, and I'm right at the end. You all get to to say bunches of stuff here. But if that's true, and I'm assuming it is, we're bumping the. Uh, well, we'll talk about it. When were steel beads available? But. Um, and are the, the study, are the beads in my uh, study quilt cut steel? And then I've got some other questions for them. How would you describe the silk like this and the silk like this? And also, why aren't they shattering at this time? We could, um, there might be some, some people who are listening who'd like to know why that might be. We know they shattered in um, crazy quilts, but uh, in the late 18, late 20, late 19th century, but these don't seem to be shattering that way. Um, I also uh, would like you to describe what's going on here. I think these are all silk and they're, they're woven. Um, they're, for the most part, really, I bet all the little hexagons in this are silk, except for maybe a dozen or so. This one, I think, is upholstery fabric. Uh, this one is a velvet with, um, you might weigh in on that. Um, and I'm wondering too, here, I think this might be, I said a Delane, uh -huh. but finally, this is my, the quilts redeeming values. Uh, for me, I think uh, it probably isn't a museum piece, but it's definitely, um, I'm glad it's, been saved. It is a study piece. I think it preserves an incredible variety of pre-Civil War dresses. And it should be saved too because I think it's an atypical quilt object. It is a hexagon mosaic, but it's not paper template pieced. 
it's bed size, not, not sturdy enough for uh, everyday use. I'm wondering what's, what that is all about. Could it be a commemorative piece? It's not precisely made as maybe a, heck, a kaleidoscope um, might. Um, they might have been going for the kaleidoscopic look, but so it's she didn't get it right, or they didn't get it right. What if it was made by a group? But that's why I like it. And hey, it's finished. And you know what? All the tacking and the beads are intact. So, what do you think, you Lynn? You want to talk about and. Alden about that dress right here. Who? Cool. Either don't... one of you. All. Well, you know well, what? The, the one on the right. Yeah, the mm -hmm. one on the right. That's a chine, C H I N E with an accent, oh. and it's a Western sort of cheater version of ecot, and um, it's achieved by setting up the the warp on the loom and then printing the design, and then when you add the weft kind of gets that muddy watered sort of um sort of look and that was certainly popular in the mid mid 19th century um and on the left you've just got one of those um plaid woven um not literally scottish version of plaid but a you know a, a multicolored checked um fabric that was also very popular um in the mid mid 19th century um lynn do you want to add to that or correct me on any of that I'm looking at my Cole's Dictionary of Textiles ah. of Dry Goods from 1890 to look up um, to look up some words here. Good. Uh, make sure that we're getting and using right. the right words. And and the other thing is that when you say why is it not shattering, um, the technique they used to that created shattered silks was. Um, a post-industrial revolution technique that happened in the later 19th century um, to where they were able to produce cheaper, lighter weight silks for a wider range of price points. And they would take the cheaper silks and dip them in metallic salt solutions. And the metallic salts would just eat away at the fabric and that produces shattered silks. So these are from an earlier period and, and not all silks from the turn of the 20th century do that. If they're better quality, then they didn't have that process done to them. But um, the reason these aren't doing that is it's before they would have been doing that anyway. So I'm right in saying that it's, it's a good clue that if silks are not shattering, it's probably earlier. It doesn't prove it, but, it, but if you've got that many silks and virtually zero of them are shattering, then yeah, I think that's a safe, a safe clue. You've got a few shattered things, but sometimes that's because of the dye also eating away. But, um, and, and of course you get some, you get some crazy quilts where almost nothing is shattering and that just means they've used more expensive silk. So you couldn't apply that to a crazy quilt, but I wouldn't say it's a guiding clue. Would anybody else, but you know, it's sort of a, it's a good clue. I think it's a good clue. You think it's a good enough clue? Yeah. It's a smoking gun. Very little is, but it's a right, good. right. I have a question. Why do you say it's not paper feet? Because there's no paper in it. All right. But I want you to look at the slide. If you look, those are whip stitches. Oh no, those aren't those aren't straight stitches. I think the paper's just been carefully removed. I think it's it's paper, it was paper feet. And then that's why you get this sort of over and over look. It's the whip stitch over the paper, which would be very consistent with the time period. Right. So I, I mean, we have to look at it a little more carefully. In some places where it might be broken, we can look. But I, I would bet you that most of this is whip stitch rather than running stitch, which would be your and own. Weren't thing. Americans, weren't the instructions, then goatees and things like that, the few instructions we have, Weren't they telling Americans to do template piecing too? Yeah. Yes. And, and definitely when you see these mid 19th century mosaics of hexagons and, and sometimes even just squares, they are whip stitched rather than, than running stitch. Hmm. So it's one of my questions. The other thing, Mary Kay, yes. is cabbage. Cabbage, yes. Mary Talk Kay about and I that. had a good time with cabbage. 
When a dressmaker made a dress for her client, she was permitted by custom to keep the leftovers. They were called the cabbage. And uh, I just wonder if this is not a dressmaker's quilt that of all the cabbage that she kept. Mm -hmm. Now, look at this and this, what do you call this? What? Figured silk. Are these figured silks? Yeah. Figured? What do you? Figured is just a nice umbrella term. Sometimes it's really hard to tell what a fabric weave is without seeing the back. So just call it figured. Some of these yeah. that you were looking at before looked like they probably were damask, but um, so and that I, red one might even be a brocade, but you yeah. can't see without looking at the back. Yeah. So I've I've got all kinds of things to say about the colors and the variety of fabrics. So if and then I've got great info about fabric names. Anyway. Uh, what about the metal? And and then how do I know it's metal? Magnet. Ah, Get yourself a. Let's see. It's not a real magnet, not a refrigerator. Woo! Okay, Lynn, we want to hear about the colors. It and is. Terms. <laughs> so, um, not to leave cut steel beads quite yet, but cut steel beads have been around since. Um, I think at least the 1820s. I've seen them in um, in purses and such from that period. So they they were certainly available in what are we saying? We're saying the 1850s for this for this quilt. Um, so the colors of it were wildly popular in the 1840s. Yeah, and. You know, it all fits in in many ways with uh, the whole romantic zeitgeist of of um, loving these muted, very beigey, soft sort of colors uh, because they were um, referring to the appearance of medieval ruins lit by twilight. I mean, that is literally what I have read in architectural advice books when they're talking about the colors that you should paint your house and that sort of stuff. And these are also, the, it's all very related, the, the colors uh, that are used in interior decorating and in fashion. So I think they're doing the exact same thing with these, uh, with the colors that were so popular in the 1840s. I think those plaids were very popular in the 1850s, as you saw in uh, the picture that I sent you to of the historic from from the page out of my historic Deerfield catalog. Uh, so I, you know I'm I'm very comfortable with an 1850s date on this. The so I pulled out my my Coles Dictionary of Dry Goods, which as I said is from 1890, to look up all kinds of words that we've been talking about, and it just really underscores the fluidity of textile terms in this period. And you can practically call anything whatever you want. <laughs> and there will Don't be somebody who will- Don't say I that. Know, I know, I know, but we there will be somebody that. who will agree with you. But so going back to our earlier conversation about Shally, I, I guess I could, rather than read it out of here, I could post this and follow up, but the terms are so fluid and and what we were talking about the the cambric on the back oh yeah of this uh that uh i'll just read this a little bit uh the town of cambria france was long famous for its manufacturers of fine muslins here in 1520 was first made a fine thin muslin of pure linen so when you're talking about earlier periods, cambric is linen, and that's what I think of in the 18th century. Hmm. Uh, blah, 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 blah. This fabric was used for fine ruffs of that period, as, for, as well as for kerchiefs. Blah, 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 blah. The Scotch were the first people to imitate the linen cambric in cotton and termed it cambric muslin. It is made of fine cotton yard, hard, twisted, and highly calendared. So that's why you get that sheen. Yes, it has a sheen on it. Right. What's calendared? In, in what is calendared, Lynn? Explain what? calendared. What's calendared? In calendared. Uh, calendared is applying a gloss by 
Well, in wool, you apply it by heat and pressure and probably uh, some starch. I think with the cotton, it's, it's definitely got starch in it. Mm -hmm. And it, which is another reason why you often find, especially the, the, really, the really low quality of this stuff is called Silesia. And that's where we get the term sleazy has a lot of starch and it it shatters yeah um, alden do you agree have you seen that oh yeah it, it gets very brittle and yeah. uh, papery and kind of and uh not very nice to the touch and you'll find it in bodices often in the bodice linings because you know let's save a few pennies on the uh, per yard on the bodice lining who's going to see it well 150 years later it's disintegrating Interestingly, this uh, cambric on back, no seams. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah. Is that? I think that's really yeah. why. Yeah, it says, um, so it says with the 36 inches, I already mentioned that. And then it says there's also a cheap cotton fabric manufactured for dress linings called respectively gloved finished and glazed cambric with 27 inches. So if you've got one that's that wide, Interesting. They yeah. probably had yet another name for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll look up I've also seen it called book muslin, but I think that that may not be oh. a good term. I, I tend to see that as a, an early catalogers term. Have you ever seen that, Lynn? Book muslin? Yeah. Uh, I think of book muslin as being the almost, you know, a real stiff, almost like a tarlatan. Hmm. Um, I read that it's very, it's early in the Jane Austen era, very fine muslin that was folded like a book, you know, uh, back and forth, like a book before it's been sliced and was sold like that. And that's why it was called huh. muslin. But it's very fine and crisp. Well, I'm not it's saying that book the muslin, I can tell you what Cole says. Okay. A glazed, starchy, transparent muslin used for the covering of library books or lining of dresses, very similar to paper cambric. <laughs> okay. There you go. Very similar to. Yeah. That explains it. Yeah. It okay. Guys, thank you. I know. But we're, oh, thank you. You know, we're going to go uh, five hours if we don't, uh, which we all okay, would. I hear you, Julie. Move those papers. Okay, I'm moving them. Uh, let's see, we're going to go to Debbie. Okay, uh, Debbie, Debbie Cooney is a quilt historian and collector with a special interest in quilts made in a 200 mile radius of Washington, D.C., Maryland, Southern Pennsylvania, and Northern Virginia. Debbie has participated in several county-specific quilt documentation projects conducted in Pennsylvania. She was editor of a Maryland album, the book from the state's do uh, documentation project, and co-author of the 2017 Uncoverings paper, Baltimore Album Quilts, New Research. So Debbie. I was surprised to learn from the consigners queried after the sale when they said that it had come, quote, from the Maryland branch of family and was made by slaves. Well, I was very skeptical of that until I compiled a family tree and found that one line had in fact lived on farms in the, near the town of Unionville in Frederick County, Maryland, and that they had indeed owned enslaved persons. George Washington Dudley, who lived from 1810 to 1895, was the central character that I found. He had grown up in a slaveholding family. His father, William, is listed in the 1830 and 1840 federal census records as owning, owning five and later just three to four enslaved persons, both males and females. In the 1840s, George's mother, born Margaret Schleiner, may have worked in the house with two enslaved females between the ages of 10 and 24 that are listed. All three might have participated in making the quilt. Some of the fabrics date to the 1840s. While Margaret died in 1849, the quilt might have been started in her lifetime. But George's wife, Barbara Luggenbeel, who lived until 1863, is more likely to have been involved in the quilt's construction. The 1850 slave census lists only one such person in the Dutterer household, a 14-year-old female. Other Dutterers living nearby also owned enslaved persons who might have helped and worked on the quilt. The local Luggenbeel families did not own slaves. 
all of the people mentioned were of German descent born in Maryland. Many Germans settled in Frederick County and surrounding counties, including Baltimore in the 18th and 19th century. They were part of waves of migration from the German states that heavily populated large areas of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the thousands of settlers. Their language and culture played very large roles in the areas where their numbers were substantial. This album feature, feature um, shows both features of both Baltimore and Pennsylvania German styles of goat making. It probably was completed in the 1850s, although it could have gone over into the 1860s. The overall construction is well done. Although the same few prints were used, differences in style suggest that the blocks were contributed by several persons. Only one block has an inscribed name, but more on that later. The quilting is uniformly excellent, so if several women did the stitching, their training must be similar. Now, Baltimore is only 45 miles southeast of Unionville, so its influence can readily be seen in the fabrics and in the patterns of the cornucopia, a blue rimmed urn, stemmed blossoms, and floral wreaths. Many motifs are built up with multiple layers of applique found on Baltimore album quilts and use the same plain turkey reds, green prints with curling black shapes, and small figured yellow prints. Several of the squares, like this one, use reverse applique a favorite technique of early Maryland quilt makers. The bouquets, the bouquet in the urn has a chintz sprig in it, reminiscent of early, earlier Maryland rotary purse or cut out chintz applique quilts. Many Baltimore albums include designs inspired by exotic chintz flowers, and Indian prints, which quilt makers replicated with calicoes. Other blocks exhibit motifs associated with the Pennsylvania Germans, especially pairs of birds or distal print that flank the red and yellow vase, a cornucopia, and the vase of tulips. The square with the heart, uh, the square with the heart-shaped insects includes two distal banks, a pair of Germanic filfots, which were symbols of good luck, and a pair of dogs. These motifs reflect those of German folk arts found on painted and incised furniture and household objects, and on paper and canvas work with decorative or religious purposes. The paper cut design that formed parts, also very Pennsylvania German, and especially the circle of leaves that resembles the daddy hex symbol, all show Pennsylvania influence. The fine quilting incorporates six lobe hex signs, two looks hearts, plus a pair of birds in two blocks, including to the sides of this odd red base. Let's see, down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It also incorporates typical Baltimore style floral motifs and undulating feather vines in the border. So this quilt is the product of the mingling of several cultural groups. The most unusual aspect is the likelihood that a Pennsylvania German influenced album was made by or with the help of enslaved women on a small Maryland farm. This one may in fact, may have been the work of one or more of the enslaved girls and women making, uh, the making using the patterns and quilting motifs selected by Barbara Dutter uh, of her reflecting her Germanic heritage. But some historians are now crediting the possible work of enslaved women on plantation quilts of the southern states, whether direct evidence exists or not. Another possibility is suggested by the pink wreath block inscribed Harriet Thompson. Mm -hmm. A free black woman named Thompson or Thompson without the P, described variously as black or mulatto, appears in a couple of locations in and around Unionville in the census of 1850. Mm -hmm. 60 and 70. The differences in spelling and ages make her identification uncertain. But if the woman, if the same woman is being described in that 30 year span, she moved from one white family to another doing housework, which is recorded in the census and perhaps sewing. 
Finding a free black woman distributing a block with her name as the only one inscribed in such a quilt would be a very rare occurrence. A significant number of free black persons lived in Frederick County in the years before emancipation and remained afterward. So this quilt is an intriguing cross-cultural creation for sure. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's wow. Cool. Yeah. So how old do you think it is? Well, I think it's 50s. I mean, the fabrics are very similar to the ones you, we see in Baltimore album quilts all the time. And there are very few of them. Um, so it looks like um, fabrics were handed out to the people who were making these because the green of the borders is also found in the center of the quilt. That you know, green with the yellow in, and black in it looked um, if not identical, incredibly similar to the to one of uh, a couple of the ones we see in the Garnhart um, quilts of Frederick County. Yes, yes. I'm kind good. of interested in the patterns. Now, this is a standard pattern here. The uh, one on second from the top on the left, sort of a poinsettia, yeah. and then down at the bottom left, that's a standard pattern, a uh, um, sort of a, a wig rose maybe. But uh -huh. there's those. The ones that are the ones with the pair of dogs, I love it. And the butterfly that looks like almost like a heart. Yeah. At the top of that, that is such a fabulous so block. Dutchy. You know, you never see that. But mm -hmm. then there's cornucopia. And the is. shape of that vase is so bizarre. That footed, oh yeah. But then the footed vase in um, on the lower on uh, C4, the bottom row, second, yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, that's taken straight out of an album quilt block mm -hmm. that someone's seen. Yeah. 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 And the cornucopia. Well, it's certainly intriguing. And the cross flowers are unusual. Yeah, those cross flowers you don't see, and I love them. This one? Um, so the Harriet Thompson that you can find her multiple times listed as a mixed race free black woman, that's pretty intriguing. Do we think? Well, it was, and I just found that. And there are no other Harriet Thompsons in Frederick County in that time period. Wow. And all of the That's... ones that are listed are either Black or Milano. And they're all in um, Fred in that small area of Frederick County. So That's pretty cool. I, I can't believe it. I mean, it's just, it would That's be just great. so. What if she was a seamstress who moved from house to house making wardrobes and stitching a little block? Well, she, that, that could be an explanation for it. I have a question about the stencil. It's a stencil. Is it a stencil or is it just inked by hand? Her name. Oh, let's go down. Up, down. Can you show it? Uh, Debbie, can you pull that up? Go back uh, to her name. Yeah. Backspace. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's, that, that's an inscription. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's really good handwriting, but of course yeah. it doesn't. Um, Either she got to a school or someone else wrote it for her or well, it was presented well, to her. Yes, well, that's what, that's interesting you brought that up because one of the people who may or may not be her is listed in the census as being unable to read or write. So ah. someone had to write it for her. Well, but okay. another, another one all the time. in a different census actually spells her name for the census or the census taker did it with two T's. Mm -hmm. So that is interesting too. Because uh -huh. there's so many ways to spell it. Right, right. Very interesting, Debbie. So I don't know. It's just, this is a mystery. Um, can I ask about the JC? So we, well, see, we yeah. see JC alone, and then two above the birds in the bottom row, second from the left. Would right. that indicate uh, a marriage of two people with the same initials? Well, there are no people with C's in the family tree. The, and the fa I asked the family, I asked through the auctioneer, I asked if the family would tell me who JC was and they said they didn't, didn't know, had no idea. So JC made this one and this one, this one and this one. Wow. So all the same fabrics of these four. Mm -hmm. huh. And they're all very interesting and well done. Yes. And they all seem to have a little bit of reverse applique as well. Huh. 
So if you look at the census records and look at the neighborhood, is there anybody with a C nearby? Well, I have to go back and look, but I should do that because. Um, yeah, that might be an interesting uh, next step. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. The census shows that they were not real wealthy farmers and didn't have huge land holdings, but um, they had substantial farms, but they did have nearby neighbors. So the farms weren't that large that they might not have, you know, that they would have had some JCs around them. So I'll check that. You know, go up to A for, is that a Christmas cactus? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got things I've never seen on anything else. Yes. <laughs> and then if you go down to C4, is that a variation of the apple pie ridge or? Oh, yes, it is kind of. It, you know, it it's really... Because there aren't many patterns, you know, because they're so dramatic that are not four-way mirror image, but that is one of the quirky ones where it's like cutting paper and you know how it always works out when you're uh -huh. cutting paper with six-year-olds, everything falls apart. So <laughs> I've cut a lot of paper with six-year-olds, but uh, it does have that apple pie ridge look that sort of... Uh, a flirt of Lee got awry. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. It's the perfect combination of Pennsylvania and Maryland, too. It yeah. sure is. Okay. We have 20 minutes left. Okay. Oh, and Julie hasn't had a chance to talk. And, you know, and oh, Alden hasn't. Yeah. Well, we'll prop this. Mary Kay looks so good. Okay, let's move on to Alden. And... Um, and I'll finish up. And uh, Alden, you're about to screen share. Okay, let me talk about yep. you. Alden O'Brien is the costume and textile curator at the DAR Museum, specializing in late 18th and early 19th century clothing and quilts. Her exhibitions include Eye on Elegance, Early Quilts of Maryland and Virginia, and A Piece of Her Mind, Technology and Culture in American Quilts. Thank you. So the quilt I brought to show and tell today, virtually brought, is one in the DAR collection, which was in the Ion Elegance um, exhibit. And so you can see it online and zoom it up um, way high. Um, and it is attributed, um, it was donated by the family. And it was attributed to Elizabeth Kobler, whose initials you see down in the lower right, uh, who was married to a um, man whose name is very, very hard to find in the records because you see him as Barney, Barnhart, and Barnett, Copler, Kobler, Copler, interchange the K the, and the C, the B and the P, the A and the E. It's, it's a nightmare finding this man. Um, and they were, came from Berks County, Pennsylvania, and he was a tailor. And the family story was that he made the, that she made this quilt out of scraps from military Revolutionary War uniforms sewn by Barney. And indeed, it is an all wool quilt. Um, it's it's sort of a basically a framed medallion, but you can see that after the first few set, uh, the center bits, it starts going a little bit wonky. And then out in the outer bits where I have the circles and the ovals, you see some um, pieced and appliqued um, bits. And on the lower right here, you see um, some, you know, little cutout appliqued um, hearts. Um, in these pieced stars. And here we have some pinked rosettes, uh, multi-layered um, little um, cockade-like rosettes. And then a lot of these fabrics are the kind of things we can see were used in coats or breeches. There are a lot of blues and buffs and reds of the kind that would have been used in military uniforms, but there are also a lot of other things like uh, up in the upper right here, we have this shag, this, um, and we have these printed and woven stripes and we have some corduroys and some velveteens and we have, these woven stripes. Um, 
we have some waistcoat fabrics and uh, I think that our faces are obscuring my little picture of the waistcoat there, but never mind. You can see a cool. waistcoat of the late 18th century. Um, now the problem with the Revolutionary War uniform attribution is that many of these fabrics post-date the revolution. Mark Hutter, who's the tailor at um, Colonial Williamsburg and an expert in menswear has looked at it and he said, there are things here that date to the 1790s in terms of their um, general aesthetics, such as this waistcoat fabric right in the middle here and in some of their colors. Um, such as the sort of celery green that we see in a couple of places. Um, and the scale of these designs is very typical of the very late 19th, uh, 18th century, um, which is when this fabric dates. So the aesthetics um, um, give it a later date than, the, um, than that uh, Revolutionary War thing. But we do know he was a tailor. He applied for a Revolutionary War pension and he got depositions from some of his old war buddies to say, yes, I knew old Barney, he was a tailor, uh, even though his pay stubs say he was a wagon driver, but that isn't mutually exclusive. He could have been um, also sewing during, during the war or whatever. Um, Family said he was in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, which of course then was Virginia, but we actually find him in Washington County, which is the Western panhandle of Maryland. Um, lots of very careful piecing. Um, so this is kind of interesting um, as a quilt on its own, but what the question arises, did Elizabeth make it or did Barney make it? And the reason I ask that is that these all wool quilts, which are um, inlaid patchwork, so edge to edge piecing, are a German tailor's tradition. There are military quilts that are made this way. And also um, it was a tradition in Germany for journeyman tailors to make it. Um, when you work with these heavy wools that, um, that a lot of coats were made of, you can't really hem them. You have to sew them edge to edge. And so um, here's an example from um, Annette Giro's collection that was in the War and Peace exhibition. And you see some uh, basic similarities. Um, certainly the Kobler family quilt is not at the same level of refinement and, and um, uh, uh, you know, elaborateness and so on. But the, it does beg the question. Yes, we have the EK there. And normally we say, oh, that means who the maker is. On the other hand, uh, perhaps it was made by Barney or perhaps he taught her the skills and she did it. Um, you can also see in different parts of the quilt, uh, some are better done than others. So, you know, is Barney better at this tailoring sewing technique and he's responsible for areas that we see on the right and she's a little less good. I don't mean to diss Elizabeth, maybe she was a great seamstress, I don't know. But you do get this um, variety within the quilt. And so that is um, what I have to bring to school today for, for discussion. Well, I'm gonna show something. I, tr I had a while ago, let me see if I can show this now. A I while ago, I had tried to figure out how to do that inlay patchwork, that intarsia uh -huh. is so, um, it's, it's complicated. So here, let me see if this will show. Can you see that? Yes. All right. So here's my here's my diagram, which is sort of dopey. You cut the white background, you cut a heart out, and at the same time, you have two layers. You cut a green heart out of mm -hmm. the foreground, and then you not apply them. There's no seams mm -hmm. here. You stick them in there, mm -hmm. and then you do a whip stitch over them. Yeah. And in, because as you say, these are so um so thick that you can't really hem them so right. that's one and then i i just found another one that i liked and i don't know if that'll work or not but we'll try it we'll see if we can oh. now there isn't a lot here where it's literally inlaid like the those hearts are actually appliqued on top of something else some, so some of them but, are appliqued. but so but each, yeah. pe each geometric piece is sewn edge to edge so I'm, I'm using that term inlaid or intarsia patchwork a little bit lucidly because it's not as if the applique is, is set in like that, but it is pieced edge to edge the way those are. Well, here's, here's one that I've just poking around looking for these inlaid quilts. 
This is a Wrexham Taylor's quilt in the National Museum of Wales. And you mentioned Germany, but I think it was also very much an English tradition. Oh, yes. I didn't mean to exclude England. It's just yeah. I didn't have very much time. But absolutely, you see these things in England, too. Yeah, so here's but, uh, He one. was a German-American immigrant. And so yeah. he would have been coming, he would have been apprenticed to a German uh, American tailor coming out of that German um, tradition. And I also, you know, the, the colors are always the same. And that's because yeah. that was what Wolves dyed at the time. Um, I think this one is dated to 1840s, 50s maybe. Yeah, and you get soldiers making them too. I mean, there was a lot of that in War and Peace. Um, a lot of them were made by sold, invalid soldiers who were, you know, given occupational therapy essentially but but with the Kobler quilt I think that the relevant connection is the is the tailor tradition and so if he was taught as a tailor um, with a German background coming out of this uh, tradition of making quilts out of menswear fabrics maybe he's the one who made it um, I think I think that's a pretty good guess I mean I think the initials EK it's not Elizabeth. It's just such a, a male tradition, male culture. That's what I think, yeah. And we've attributed it to, to Elizabeth, but um, the more I, I think about it, the more I think we should be saying, I think in my label in the exhibit, I said, which is coming up on a good six or eight years ago now, um, I think I said something like, you know, he may have taught her or something like that. And Mark Hutter has been after me for a decade or more about this. And he keeps saying, Elizabeth did not make that quilt. Barney made that quilt. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're advocating for the tailor, but I'm still taking it with a grain of salt. I'm still not sure. But I think with, over time, I'm becoming increasingly persuaded. What do, you, what do the rest of you think? The salt is dissolved, Heather. What? The salt is dissolved. I think you, the grain of salt is, I think it's a man's quilt. That's right. What about the different levels of skill shown in it? Well, that's what makes me wonder whether it was a joint project or, um, you know, he the also had children and maybe he was teaching the children. Um, or his apprentices. Or he had apprentices. He, um, he kind of disappears from the record after the 1790 census. I can't really find him, but we know he was alive in 1815 when he got that pension. But um, yeah, that's a good point. Apprentices, children, um, his granddaughter is listed in the 1850 census as a um, seamstress. So, you know, maybe this uh, sewing tradition carried on in the family in the intermediate generation, and that's partly what we're seeing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, when we were talking about this last time in our practice session, somebody said, could it be earlier? Could it have been brought over from Germany? But uh, at that point, we had lost track of the fact that, you know, several of these things definitely post-date the revolution. And we know that although he was, um, uh, by the, uh, through the revolutionary period, he was in Berks County, Pennsylvania, but he had moved to Maryland by the 1790s because he's in the 1790 Maryland uh, census in Maryland. So that rules out it's being made in, in Europe, but you know, coming out of that European tradition. So, yeah. But it's so American in, I think, in the way it's, it's pieced and all. I mean, it's not the intarsia at all. I know that was something that I, I, uh, John Stiles or anyway, some other expert came in and talked to me when I was working on the Anna Tools quilt at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Mm -hmm. um, and it has applique, you know, just cut out and applied um, as opposed to being laid in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was pointed out to me as being very American, not that's a good point. I think that 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 is a very good point that that shows a departure from the tradition. So visually, you can see it coming from the tradition, but at the same time, you see departures from it. I think yeah. Marcia would be very difficult to do. I think it, it really is a, a show off of your skill and certainly mm -hmm. will applique. And maybe he just didn't need to show off his skill with this. It was just a teaching tool and, you know, using what he had and who knows. How about intarsia and cotton and calico? How often do we see that? I don't think it would be 
How could you do that? I think that that I think that's as, as close as we get as reverse applique. Yeah. You but but something but, be fairly substantial. You but know, remember, before I was married to a carpenter for a long time, and he did a lot of inlay and uh, marquetry. And mm -hmm. it was it was tough. He did it because he loved doing it, but he would cut the ebony and the white wood, same shape, and then he would sand and sand wood to get them just to fit perfectly. And you look at parquetry floors, that's the way they're done. It's a skill. You get I'm um, thinking of the I'm thinking of it wrong because you see those sort of designs that on the surface they look like intarsia, but they're really paper piece, aren't they? Mm. Just, where, you, yeah. where everything's fitted so carefully because you see that in some English yeah. and Barbara, remember silver. remember that quilt that was brought in when I the first time I met you 35 years ago mm. at historic Northampton we were doing a quilt ID and that woman came in and you were like 50 feet away from her and you saw the quilt being brought in and you were tired and it was the end of the day and you like wanted to finish but you saw her walking in and you're like I want to see that quilt <laughs> and it was it was one of one of those you know very finely paper piece but looks like intarsia uh -huh. yeah and which yeah. was Dodie's was showing you all the time which yeah. they were just about impossible to do with so oh, never mind I don't know what I'm talking about yes you do I mean, Gody showed you the, the piecing thing that looked like in Parsia, but I, did anybody ever make them? Okay, I'm up. Yes. I am, I am, or Julie is, a quilt lover, amateur quilt sleuth, author, buyer and seller of antique and vintage quilts, curator of quilt exhibitions, including American Quilts, a Handmade Legacy at the Open Museum, California, and Amish, the Art of the Quilt at the De Young Museum, Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. I was also the full-time curator of the Esprit Quilt Collection uh, for a whole bunch of years. And um, I'm a recent convert, as I think we all are, to Zoom lecturing. Um, <laughs> the book that I brought, let's see if I can, oh, don't tell me. I had it before. Let's see, basic. Click basic. I clicked basic and I had it before. Isn't that, isn't that irritating? Barbara, are you pausing? I'm going to have to. And pause. All right. Uh, the quilt I brought today is a quilt that I have um, owned for a very, very long time. And it's, um, it's uh, kind of raggedy. Um, in fact, uh, I bought it at an antique show and it was folded up almost uh, haphazardly underneath a, a dealer's um, uh, table and I but I saw some of these um, flags and I thought okay I gotta see what this is so let's look at some details um, you can see how raggedy it is and um, here you can see some of the fabric it had a mouse hole or something like that and you know, it's in pretty rough shape um, but those of us who um, know something unusual would pick up on something like this. And then again, you can see um, some of the damage. Obviously the thing that intrigued me was um, the flags coming out of the basket, but in particular, these strawberries and how they are in some places floating and some places standing straight up. There's also this kind of peony or uh, whatever that might be. Here, there, um, the strawberries are on a vine and drooping over. And this is the thing that, of course, intrigued me almost the most. And it's up here in the left-hand corner. It's a piece of muslin that's attached, sewn on to the front of the quilt. And let me show you a detail of that. Uh, this is W.P. Dunlap, 5818 Monte Vista Street made by an old colored slave before the Civil War. Um, so not being a uh, genealogist or good researcher, to be honest, um, 
I started to look for Mrs. W. P. Dunlap, and there I and I also went to you know at five eight one eight Monta Vista Street, and um, I found um, a bunch of things, and one of them was in Los Angeles, and I brought that to my pals here, and um, we discovered some new things. Um, who was it of you that figured Alden. out? Who was Barbara? Alden. Alden. I'm the ancestry queen. Yeah. And so we figured out, um, with Alden's help, that Mrs. W. P. Dunlap was uh, at 5818 Monta Vista Street, was in Los Angeles, which is um, quite interesting. And Alden, do you remember the uh, dates or anything like that? Did we get I think that was in the 1930 and 1940 censuses I could find her and her husband. Her yeah. husband. Yeah. So the question, uh, some of the questions that came up um, was it really made by an old colored slave before the Civil War? And what did Mrs. Dunlap have to do with it? Um, let's just go uh, for a few more details here. Yeah. So and the Dunlaps were both born in Wisconsin, so it's not as if this was an old family piece from, you know, the good old days. Right. Huh. That blue, uh, we didn't see that. Yeah, before. that's I weird. Didn't, wow. I didn't, didn't show you that last time. And then here's the other printed fabric. Yeah. That's pink. I mean, my, my color is not very good on any of this, but that's a, a pink figured, hmm. figured cotton. Um, and it occurred to me as we were looking at it when during our practice session here that it might be a pot holder cloak. And in fact, it is. Oh, oh my gosh, don't tell Pam. Well, here's the it's thing. done. So I invited Pam on Facebook, I invited her to join this group and I said to her, um, come if you can, because I have this quilt that is a potholder quilt that I think you'd like to see. And she wrote me back and said, you lent this to me 10 years ago for an, for an exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't make it into my book, she said, but it got into the exhibition. I wrote back and I said, you know, Pam, of all the things I'm missing, I'm missing most of my memory. <laughs> That was Pam Weeks, right? Pam Weeks? Yeah. Pam Weeks, who is um, the potholder queen. And has a book like on the verge of being published. Yeah, she said, she said today or yesterday when I was in touch with her that it's finished. Um, so it's out of her hands, apparently. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, let's talk about um, some of the things that we looked at for date. Um, mm. One thing to point out is that there's machine stitching on it. It is, is that repair fact, fabric or is that original? It's my thought too, Lynn. What's the question? Is that repairs? A good no. repair? No. Um, I'm, I have the quilt right here. Let me see if I can show it to you guys. But look no. at that green up at the top. I mean, that is 19th century. It overdyed. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well. I found her in the census in 1920, and she was 54 in 1920. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there are no repairs on this quilt. Really? I mean, if somebody was going to repair it, there were plenty of places for her to repair. <laughs> Dark. But um, that is so weird. Oh. I thought it was early. I, 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 it struck me as quite mid-century or earlier. Mm -hmm. Well. Let's go back to an overall. Yeah, let's go back to an overall. Where are the red bits and where are the baskets? Are the baskets? Okay. So my guess, my, my, my near jerk reaction is always a brown basket might have been something else. Mm -hmm. Might've yeah. been red, might've been green. Probably yeah. not green, if you, well, maybe green. That's, so I'm saying this is my knee jerk, you know, a default yeah. plot. Then I go after 1880 because uh -huh. that's when you see those reds and greens fading. But, but, you know, those greens on the little peony things are so 1860, right? 40, yeah. overdyed. Huh. It's butt edge. Don't know if that's important, but it's a uh, knife edge. Mm, well, that would go with the potholder thing. Uh -huh. But you've only got two of those funky blue blocks. 
Yeah. Oh, that's true right there, though. Right. I I just think there's something weird going on with those. Do, do you think this was possibly assembled later? But but they have the peony type things in them that that you see in a lot of the other squares. Mm -hmm. They do. And uh, that are older. So what if somebody inherited, this is a nightmare. What if you inherit a lot of potholders? And <laughs> <laughs> you inherit a UFO, uh, unfinished object, and then what? And then what? Well, Julie, if you stop your slide share, your screen share, I will try and do my screen share because I have two other quilts that, re one that reminds me remarkably of it. So this is Martha McNeely Fry, no date, in the Indiana State Museum. Same basket, exactly, as yours. And maybe if I go up a little bit, I don't want to do that really. Um, so I want to look at the next one. Flag. It's all green, you know, none of the browns. It's got the flag with the union. It's got very similar kind of small, semi-crude appliques in the basket. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to show you some random things. Someone, Kay, Kay Ross did a reproduction of it for the AQSG once. Uh -huh. It's awfully cute. So here's the pair. Huh. Let's see what's next. I actually have done a reproduction of it, just that one block one time, because it's very appealing. Uh -huh. um, and we're going the wrong way. We're going to go the wrong way. We've got to go back to some of the details. Now, Julie loves, and this is one in the Iowa State Museum. You don't see baskets with flags very often. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so evocative, such a great idea. But here in the, Julie's quilt is on the left, and this is Martha Fry's on the right. So we have paired flags. Mm -hmm. We have this little thing, although I did not find exactly the same thing in Martha's. And Martha has strawberries too. Wow. wow. So let me go back. But I, oops, I guess that's it. What I, that might be all I got. That might be all I got. Um, I think Martha's definitely makes me think it's mid, mid 20th century and probably during the Civil War. I mean, 19th. 19th. But the, the coincidence of yours. And that one is just so interesting. I mean, we're not getting anywhere with yeah. this. We're just going, whoa. So, Maybe the, the construction is a clue of where it's from. You know, I did look at the Indiana, Indiana one to see if it was. Are potholders regional? No. Or is it a chronological clue? Hey, it is. Pretty much New England. New England. Yeah. And, and a lot from Maine, isn't that right? Yeah. Hmm. But, but all, all that area. Um, I'm sure Pam Weeks will have much to say about this. Good, Pam, don't forget. And time, um, they were really hot during the Civil War because it was a good way to make a group quilt you could send off to a soldier. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But they, she has older examples and she even has examples of the word potholder used, which I really was really? painful of, but <laughs> it's, it's an old term. Huh. So, hmm. um, and they go, well, they go on, you know, I made one once, don't ever take it up, ever, because then <laughs> you're stuck, well, what about a border, which is, yours doesn't have a border, Julie. Oh. Right. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I don't know if, it, we don't know if it was made by slaves before the Civil War, it's a possibility from what we're talking about today. I was very moved by the, um, by the label that Mrs. Dunlap would um, think enough, um, give enough respect to who she thought was the maker or was told was the maker, that she would actually put it on a label, put it on the front of the quilt. And um, it always strikes me that often signatures on quilts have a street address, but no town, which suggests that they never ever thought it would leave that town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, uh, Los Angeles is certainly not provincial, <laughs> but um, it must not have occurred, you know, can you imagine what they would, 
what some of these women would think about what's happened to their quilt since they put their name and sometimes just the town, right? But on I'm, a street address. But I'm, I'm guessing that, that it probably was being lent for a, a temporary display in a church for a bazaar or, you know, a fair or some kind of an event. And so she's sewing that on and giving a little information so someone can write up a label um, and also it has her name and address so everyone knows who to return it, you know, the organizers of the event know who to return it to at the end of the event, oh, right? Go, go, go smash my sentimentality. Go right ahead. <laughs> That's her job. Oh, no, I, think I, I, I don't think that negates the sentimentality. I think right. she still has made an effort to say, I think it's important that you know this was made by an old colored woman before the Civil War. She's still giving it importance. I, I'm just addressing why she might have put her name and address in that way. It didn't, it, it didn't need to be more than that because it was something in Los Angeles that she was just making sure got back to her at the end of the bazaar or whatever. Right. You know, I... I've been looking at, you know, that photo album that came from right. uh, Los Angeles. And there's another, I've had about three or four things that have coincided and they're all around Los Angeles. And I have been looking in newspapers.com um, and um, there were a lot of women's um, quilt exhibits at, oh. at churches, okay. at um, all kinds. I mean, you just put in, quilt and some and in the 30s they really show up a lot of them are dar oh, uh, people okay. who started them who, who seem to be like the historical oracle who kind of places these quilts in in context and you're, they're looking a lot at milt at uh, marie webster's book and things like that so Did i, I would be a bit surprised if maybe bernice um you know Put her quilt oh in the pomona county uh fair was a huge thing it's still going on they had lots of quilts entered in, way back in into the 30s i wouldn't did I find that she was a dar in I, fact yeah i did i okay i this is ringing i don't, know. I don't so, know oh okay um i'm trying to remember whether i because some when you put a name into ancestry sometimes the mm. name will pop up in um in the dar uh -huh. uh, membership books as one of the sources, but I can't, I can't remember whether we knew she was a DAR. Well, anyway, we're not cool. only know-it-alls, but we're talk a lot of uh, alls. <laughs> we talk a lot of alls. We've kept, we've kept our audience a little bit longer than we intended to. Um, you all watching, you can tell that this is fun for us and that we learn from each other and we really hope that this has been um, enjoyable for you guys. And uh, let us know. And Again, remember, there's going to be a question and an answer. We're going to be live on Saturday at the end of the recorded session. But let us know, because um, this was fun for us, and we might want to do it again.